and welcome to the Write the Book Inside You podcast. Tips, tools, and interviews for coaches and healers like you who want to write a non-fiction book to boost your visibility, clients, and cash flow while making a difference. I'm your host, Carol Westmore, a multi-published author and energy psychology tapping book coach. Now let's jump into today's episode. I'm welcoming Derek Dipka, and he's going to talk to us tonight about why authors fail and how you can start out on your author journey with the right mindset, motivation, and everything you need to be a writer and an author. Hello, Derek. Hey, Carol. Great to be here. Derek, one of the things that I really connected with you about is how important it is to um, connect with your internal motivation, as well as the the blocks you're going to encounter when you set out on your author journey. I think when people get excited that they're going to write a book, and then they sort of jump in, and then it's, "Uh uh-oh, and then what do you think the main questions that uh, come up? For, for new authors? Yeah, so I was actually just talking uh, with someone the other day about her journey when she first got started. And uh, I think this experience matches a lot of authors where it's like, you kind of have this calling, maybe some sort of message inside that you want to get out. And so first it's, it's really exciting because uh, it's like, okay, yeah, I can put this, I can put this into a book. And then you know, kind of go, wait, like how, how do I take all this stuff that's in my head and actually put it into a book. Like what's the structure? What's the organization? So I think that is one of the early challenges in terms of uh, the structure. And sometimes even before that, what I went through is like, well, okay, but is there anything I can say that hasn't already been said a million times before, right? There's so many other authors, so many writers, so many coaches. So it's kind of like, what do I have to say that's different? If I do have something to say that's different, how do I Uh, organize it. So it's like you have all these ideas floating around and don't know how to actually put it into a book uh, that's going and then know if that's even going to make an impact. So I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges and hurdles that I hear that I went through and and from a lot of other uh, authors and and writers, especially those who want to make an impact, the coaches, the consultants, uh, the healers of the world. So that's the the challenge to overcome, and I can dive into you know, tips for that. But I would say that's the biggest, uh, some of the yes. biggest things. Yes, and also on a personal note, you know, I often I've, I've read, and you've told me because I've worked with you, um, that you were a musician, but at one point a valet, you know, just to make ends meet, and you hadn't made that d- uh, cross over the divide into being a best selling author, which you became. So just take us back a little bit in time to how you started out because being a musician, I presume you were creative, but where did the writing a book come in? Yeah, I got my degree in music. So I was the creative type. And if this comes up later, when it comes to marketing, I I was not into marketing. I was not into business. I was like, I just want to write music and become a rock star. That was my (laughs) whole mentality. And then the transition into writing actual, not just writing music, but writing books or it started out with blogging. That came when I moved to Los Angeles in 2011. And I was working as a valet parker. I was also part-time delivery, hot wings delivery driver. And so being broke, sleeping on an air mattress, I was looking for ways to make extra money. Uh, And ultimately, I wanted to build some sort of business that I could pursue my passion for music. So that got me into this whole online world of you can blog, you can do YouTube videos, you can teach what you knew uh, or what you know. And I knew health and fitness uh, because I was also into that and I had people ask me about it. So that got me into going, okay, I'll just start creating videos and blogging and things like that. But when it came to writing a book, that idea came to me. Um, might have been Brendan Burchard's Millionaire Messenger, uh, where I first kind of heard the idea or, or some, you know, some seminar or something like that. And my first thoughts, like I said, were a book, you know, I'm just, I'm a no name valet parker like who who would listen to me like versus the tony robbins or the jack canfields <laughs> or whoever so it's like eh, okay that's not for me 
Well, eventually I gained some more confidence. And, and one thing that helped me was realizing that, okay, well, if people keep asking me for advice, then it's not that they're buying your information. They're buying your perspective. They're buying your experience, your stories. You know, people trusted me, you know, just my friends or family, they trusted me. So yeah, they could have gone out and read a book by maybe some guru, but that's not who they turned to. They turned to someone that they knew and they wanted to hear my perspective on it. And that's when I realized that you could hear the same thing a hundred times from a hundred different people, but someone might not, might need to hear it from you the way that you have to say it with your background and experience. And, and that's what I was going to say. You must have developed some expertise. I think some of your first books were on body uh, health, weren't they? What was your first book? Yeah, first book uh, was called Excuse Proof Fitness, and it was essentially just taking what I knew from, um, it wasn't quite a decade at that point, but a number of years, probably seven years plus of just being into health and fitness myself. And I call this, there's a few different archetypes, uh, I call author archetypes, but one was the role model archetype, where yes. you're just sharing your your life experience. Hey, here's what I found is helpful. It's not like saying this is what you have to do yourself because yes. maybe it won't work for someone else. But here's some of the cool thing. Here's how I ate healthy when I was on a busy schedule. I used a slow cooker. Here's some of the recipes I made. Here's mm -hmm. some of the exercises that I find are helpful, what I can do at home or whatever. Here's some of the mindset tips. So it was really just sharing personal experience about what I, I knew. And I would say uh, pretty much every single person on this planet has something that you've you've been through uh, pain that you've overcome, uh, a goal that you've achieved where people could learn from you. And sometimes this is the other thing I realize: it's not about me having all the answers. Uh, a mentor um, shared this idea of one hand up, one hand down. So you always have one hand up to your mentors, your inspirations, people who are teaching yes. you. But you always have one hand down, helping people who might be a little earlier on in the journey. Yes. And when I, when I got that, I go, no matter where you're at, even if you don't think like you're quote unquote there yet, you're further along than someone else. And as long as you're further along than someone else, what you have to share is valuable to them. Yes, especially if you already have done coaching. Some of the people are an EFT expert and you've been, you know, you've got hours like that. I've done months and years of, of coaching um, people with the journey and EFT and I was getting these huge transformations and when I came to uh, be, having been a journalist, wanting to put them into a book, that flummoxed me. I was overwhelmed by how would I start? And so knowing what you learned in that time today, where you can't quite be, um, you have to have a structure, don't you, today? I mean, I'm, the way I'm teaching in the Write the Book Inside You program is perhaps you have three parts and then, you know, you do your outline that way. Um, but anyway, so the point I was, I really take your point, whether or not you're already, you might be a starting out coach. I think that's the point you're making. But you have, you have some expertise and wisdom that you've already gained, even by the fact that you wanted to be a coach in that particular area. I believe you're a coach, you've, you know, you've like trained in NLP um, and, and use that, do you, as a psychological method of enticing people to buy a book. Yeah. So, and I'll, I'll speak to this point of, I found it doesn't matter um, where a person is at. A lot of times, the more expertise someone has, um, and there's exceptions to this, but sometimes people who are just downright absolute experts with years of experience, even they will, will doubt themselves or have imposter syndrome. So it's like, it's just if you feel that way, whether you go, well, I'm, I'm starting out or I've been doing this for 27 years, like imposter syndrome can show up <laughs> for anyone uh, at any time. So it's actually a, a good sign in a sense. Uh, it's, it's not something that you want to fall into. But the fact that if someone does feel that way of like, well, am I really an expert? Uh, do I really have enough? Or yeah, I have a lot of experience, but so do other people. The thing is, the flip side of that are people who um, it's kind of like a little bit of knowledge is dangerous. They've learned a little bit and then they think they know it all. Mm -hmm. okay? The fact that if you actually kind of question yourself, that is a good sign of not just some humility, but it actually means you know enough to know that you don't know everything. 
So when you realize you don't know everything, that's actually the sign that you know a lot, which is kind of an an interesting idea. So I would just say that if anyone is feeling that, uh, feeling that way, like you're not sure, am I really enough? Do I really have enough to put into a book? Or I know I have enough to put into a book, but so there's, you know, a hundred other books on this healing method or uh, whatever it is. It's like, again, it's not about just your knowledge. It's about your experience, your stories, your perspective Mm. that you bring to the table. And then with NLP, um, this is something I I started studying NLP just casually, I guess, back when I got into personal development, which would have been about 2011, uh, 2010, 2011. Uh, But I didn't get trained into in at the trainer level or coach level until a few, few years back. What I did get was even though it wasn't called NLP and NLP is really just a kind of an umbrella term for a lot of things. Mm. What really made the difference was understanding psychology, Mm. persuasion, influence. And the reason why was not only to entice people to read the book, which was a key piece was how I structured the chapters and the description, but even for myself, like I needed to learn how to motivate myself to break through, you know, these limiting beliefs and all of this sort of stuff. So that's the great thing. If you're a coach, if you're a healer, a lot of times I find that the challenges that you might be going through with writing a book, just imagine if someone else were to come to you with those same challenges and you were coaching them or you're helping them overcome the the traumas or the wounds of whatever it is. And a lot of times you might find the advice that you would give to someone else could actually be some of the best advice for yourself too. Yes, but I do I do teach that you go when you set out to write your book, you, it's like the hero's journey in many ways. You get the call to action, you get a mentor maybe who encourages you, and then you maybe the internal demons and dragons on the way, the challenges, the messy middle, before keeping in mind your commitment to get to the prize, because that's as I've I've, you know, I've re- read in your work, you need that commitment and. When it comes to, the, there's a lovely um, overwhelm. You, when it, we're talking about overwhelm because sometimes when I'm teaching, I say these are some of, I call them the book hooks. There's the title, there's the problem, there's a solution. Your audience, you must know your reader and maybe niche. In, in other words, choose, you know, drill down with your first book. Um, and then they, I can see the overwhelm starting. They didn't realize there were all these things. So you also have to slow down to baby steps. But there was something you said. Um, you can't do everything, but you can. I think it was something like you can do something, one thing at a time. And then you've got your three magic words. Please share that mm-hmm. with us, with the audience. Yeah. So first the quote, and I don't know who originally said it, but I heard it from Alex Mandosian. You can't do everything, but you can do anything, one thing at a time. Mm-hmm. And this leads back to uh, the three magic words, which is the cure for overwhelm. It's a cure for fear, uh, overload, uh, you, you name it. I haven't found something that this isn't effective in some way for this three magic words technique. And the three magic words are, can I just? And the power is not so much in those words. Those words are just a prompt. It's a setup for what follows. And what follows is something called a micro commitment. And a Stanford psychological researcher, B.J. Fogg, who uh, specializes in behavior change, he calls this concept a tiny habit. Uh, Stephen Geis has a book called Many Habits. There's people who talk about this idea where the micro commitment is something so tiny, so small, you're guaranteed to be able to say yes to it. So here's what this would look like. Can I just open up my word processor and, and, and write one sentence today or right now? And that's it. If, if I want to stop after that, that's okay. But can I, can I just do that? Mm-hmm. And the answer should be yes. But let's say it's not yes. Okay, can I just open up my word processor? Can I just write one word? Like you take it so small that you end up getting, okay, yeah, I'll do that. What happens if, you op- if I open up my word processor and I, I type one sentence, then I go, well, can I just type one more? Well, yeah, okay. What if I don't know what I want to write about? Can I just type nonsense? for a little bit. Can I just type, um, I see a water bottle sitting on my desk, like this free journaling type of thing. Mm-hmm. And what will happen is the, the tricky part, people go, well, what's that going to do? That's not a big deal. But if you've ever got, if you ever not felt like doing something and then you got started and then you couldn't stop, like you just kept going, it illustrates this idea that momentum generates motivation. 
Mm-hmm. If I want to get myself to clean my place, I don't say I'm going to clean my whole place today. As soon as I think that I go, nah, I get to it later. <laughs> but if I go, can I just clean my desk? Can I just, you know, I don't even have to clean the whole desk. Can I just clean this one corner of my desk? Then I can stop. It'll only take me 30 seconds. So I psych myself into it. Well, I can't clean a corner of my desk without then going, well, I might, might as well finish the rest of it. Well, now that looks pretty good. Why don't I, I clean my mm. bathroom now? Like I, you get into it. And I, I it's really started with fitness and working out where if I'm sitting around watching Netflix and then I go, can I stop what I'm doing and, and do a workout? I'll probably say no. But mm. if I go, okay, can I just take 30 seconds to stand up, shake out my body, dance for a little bit, and then I can decide what I want to do. Well, if I take 30 seconds to stand up and move my body and then I go, well, can I just do five minutes of exercise? I can stop after that. Mm. Well, okay. Yeah. And then you do that. If you've ever gotten started exercising and then once the blood is flowing and you're into it and you're feeling good, then it's, it's so much easier to keep going to the point where it might be harder to stop uh, going forward with it than to just keep the momentum going. So the whole idea, and that's to, that's to get yourself into action how this helps with overwhelm uh, is overwhelm is thinking about all the things that you have to do, but you're only ever doing one thing. So if you take a step back and you go writing a book, it's all of this mm-hmm. stuff. It's organizing the ideas and who is it going to be going towards and what's the, the title going to be and the, the audience and how's it going to be different? How many do that? There's all these pieces that eventually you need to do. Um, but the tricky or the deception part is you're actually only ever really just doing one little piece Mm. at a time and you can handle all of those pieces. So can I just takes you out of seeing the whole mass of things that you need to do, which is important for planning and looking forward. So you do want to kind of zoom out and see the big picture, the 50,000 foot view, but then you also need the ability to zoom in and get focused and say, okay, today, all I need to do is finish one chapter. Maybe that's Mm. the goal. Okay. And right now, can I just write the, the first paragraph of the chapter? I can come back to it later if I want, but can I just write the first paragraph? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, I can do that. Well, you write one paragraph. You might then stop and take a break or you might go, oh, I got one paragraph. Oh, this, okay, this sparks this other idea. Let me keep going. <laughs> and yes. I can't tell you how many times I'm done with the, the, the chapter and I'm like, wait, how'd that happen? I didn't mean yes. to do this whole chapter, but I'm done. And then you take that day by day, moment by moment, day by day until the whole thing is done. Yes, I really love that. And and you can apply it to something else I also say to people, to, to my clients, that if you if you say you've got 10 chapters, you've got you've done your outline, it does help and it does help to have some chapters. You don't have to start at the beginning and start climbing up Everest. You can you can take a chapter or a memory, uh, something that happened, a story you're going to tell. Or sometimes if you if you're a coach, people come to you and, and you go through a whole session and you think wow that's just what I'm trying to explain in my book and although you must change obviously for you know people's stories it it really can it doesn't have to be linear you know that you're not writing the beginning and then you know to the end just and people found that sort of chunking bits as well quite useful and especially if you're doing it can I just can I just tell the story of the client you know who overcame um, her skin rash because of with EFT tapping. Can I just write that story? And and I think that that's um, one very useful thing that goes with can I just. Do, do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. This is I'm glad you brought that up. You're teaching a really good technique uh, or approach, which is essentially start with what's what's easiest or start with your inspiration. Go with where you already kind of have some momentum. So if you just got off a call with a client, think about is that some momentum you're kind of thinking about what you just talked about and you're maybe feeling kind of fired up about it and you go you know while you're in that state just ride that momentum be like okay so i'm going to start writing about this or it could be i'm going to record a note about it and then transcribe that and that'll go into uh into the the book so you absolutely can start with the easiest thing and this is a something i learned with doing let's say a, a a book description right you're you're absolutely right you don't have to do a linear um, process. I learned this writing sales pages, book descriptions, where you might think about what it would look like. Okay. Maybe you have kind of like a headline, you have the opening paragraph, you have some bullet points about what's going to be included in the, in the book. And I found that for whatever reason, mentally, it's harder for me to write, um, headlines, but I enjoy writing bullet points. Well, a lot of times a good headline is actually just a, a bullet point that I write that I turn into a headline. 
Hmm. So the whole point here is it's not about my process. It's about knowing yourself. And for me, I go, what's the part that's the easiest and most fun for me to do? I'll start with that. And so I'll create, you know, maybe a bunch of bullet points and then I'll look at what I created. And I go, well, that actually kind of sparks an idea for a story that I could tell in the, in the description that sparks an idea for a headline that I can use. So by getting yourself into that momentum with whatever comes easiest or quickest, or you have the most momentum or it's, it's, it's fresh on your mind, whatever that is, then you can use that. And from there, you might actually find the seeds of the next thing. And then you create the next thing and that gives you seeds for the next thing. And it becomes a stepping stone process. Yeah, oh, that's beautiful. Uh, Derek, is there a book that has influenced your life? It's very, you know, we, 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 as creatives, we find many books along the way, but maybe one from your childhood or, you know, that, that you thought, that made a difference, maybe a nonfiction book or a fiction book. And, and more recently, a book that really you could say is, was life changing. Mm. Well, uh, I would do two different things then. So if I go back earlier in time, I remember um, a book that, so when he first said it, I thought Secrets of the Millionaire Mind by T. Harv Eker. Mm. Um, before that, I remember the first real, like, I guess, self-help book you could call it. I read that impact in my life was how to win friends and influence people by Dale Carnegie. And that, especially being an introvert and like, I, it was helpful uh, on multiple levels to actually go, here's how you actually interact with people and be like, <laughs> communicate and, and stuff like that. And I think about it, I'm like, man, where would I be without that book that taught me so much? But it it also taught me that you can change yourself or you can learn these skills. And it's not just a matter of like, oh, I'm an introvert, so I'm doomed to being whatever. It's like, no, I'm an introvert, which is actually many wonderful skills involved with that. And I can learn all these things that I um, maybe didn't come naturally to me, so to speak. And um, what I something? love, I love when you said that book, because I've worked with you and one of the things and in your emails that I get and your a fantastic email list is that you don't, first of all, you don't see people as competitors. You see them as, what is the word, um, companions, no matter how, what influences they are. And secondly, if you are reaching out to someone, you often say, give them a compliment or show that you've listened to their podcast. And, and, and that really probably comes from that, that Dale Carnegie book. Am I right? You know, you're very, you're very good at teaching that and being that yourself, being compassionate. I think you once said compliment, connect and compassion, you know, and how can I contribute? Tell us a bit more, you know, how, how you've actually, how it's, how it's brought you forward in your life to where you are now with your coaching and book writing. Yeah. So one of the things Dale Carnegie talked about was, and I'll, I'll to paraphrase, but basically you, you, you win a lot more friends um, being interested in them versus trying to get them interested in you. So it taught me, and this was a strength that I, I find a lot of introverts uh, have and not that introversion has necessarily to do with social skills, uh, but there's usually a correlation where um, I sit there and I go, I don't really want to, I actually don't like talking that much about myself and Hey, here's what I did. And I'll hear, listen to all about me, kind of learn to do it a little bit as a marketer, but it's actually pretty effective and more effective many times to just be curious about someone else and what's going on with them. So it comes down to this trait. If you, if you think about what's the trait behind what, uh, Carnegie was talking about, I'd say it's a trait of curiosity, genuine curiosity. And even then beyond the curiosity, an actual appreciation of this person. And I was just reading something in a book and I, I don't remember um, who said it, but it's, it's like, everyone is interesting. You know, if you're, if you're bored in a conversation, it's your fault because you're not finding what's interesting about that, that person. You're not taking enough uh, genuine interest in them. So with that mentality, then how do you win friends? Well, if I, let me listen to some podcasts that they've been on. Let me read something about them. Let me actually find what's interesting and what I connect with about this person. And so this is me investing my energy to get to know them, be curious about them. And then not in a fake blow smoke sort of way, but in a real way, go, what do I actually appreciate about this person? And using that to connect with them when I reach out. And this is something to start doing uh, even before you've written a single word of a book or anything else, start forming these relationships because it's actually 
easier in some ways. If I'm connecting with people who might a year down the road be people who could share uh, you know, your book with their audience or things mm-hmm. like that, it's a lot easier if you're not going in like right off the bat thinking, okay, I want to get this person to like promote my book. Instead, it's like, I'm going to connect with this person because I really like what they're doing. And all my agenda is, is to make their day, brighten their day by telling them how much they impacted me and what I love about them and their work. And that's it. You know, later on, you might pursue deals or whatever else, but going in with that attitude, that's how I formed connections that not only had a direct impact in terms of these people maybe shared my book with their audience or promoted me, but just friendships or acquaintances that helped me when I was, you know, maybe gave me tips for my business or for writing or made connections or introductions and all these things. So I am big on the power of relationships uh, yes. for, for anything in your business, especially as an author and as a coach and as a healer. Yeah, you know, there's one tip that I've, I read recently from your, your book, um, Why Authors Fail, I think, you know, the one that you're going to tell us about. And that was to actually genuinely mention someone, an influencer in your book, that this, this person or their book changed my life. And then let them know, I'm, even before your book is finished or towards, you know, in the months before, to let them know I'm writing a book um, about, you know, about EFT tapping. And I just want you to know, I've, I've, I've really, because of your book that you maybe didn't know, that I that I read that I did leave a review but I want you to know I'm mentioning it in my book and I just appreciate that and then later there may be a spin-off from that is that what you said basically is that what you recommend for authors yeah that's that's one approach where you can mention people who've been influences in your book in the acknowledgments in the content itself so for instance I mentioned Stephen Geis I wrote a book on habits he wrote a book on habits um little different, which is part of the whole, you know, fit in, but you also stand out idea. Um, the idea was when I did it, and, and this is key, I, I understand the strategy here of, yes, when you mention people and you promote them in a sense, then that can come back to, to benefit you. But it wasn't done with a string attached mm-hmm. and it wasn't done. And this is really key to get, it wasn't done as like a sneaky tactic, like, okay, so I'm going to put them in my book and then that way they'll promote me. I did this originally. Like I just really like, I was just naturally mentioning people in my book. Like this person was awesome. Also check out their book. Um, I'd mention like uh, the Sedona method or um, you know, releasing techniques or different things in my book. And I'd be like, well, here's a book that helped me here, you know, check it out. And and I just, it was such a, a natural thing that later on, then I saw the connection of, oh yeah, as I'm, promoting people's work, just sharing it because I believe in it and telling them what I appreciate about them every now and then that would lead to a good relationship that we would then, uh, you know, maybe work together or or cross promote or something like that. But um, it's the challenge with teaching this is I want to teach it and bring it up and tell you like, these are techniques and things that you can do. But I also, the paradox is like, but don't treat it like a technique in the sense that it's it's fake or it's manipulative or it's done with an expectation that I'm only doing this if this person gives me something back. No, no, I agree. But I'm just thinking of, you know, my audience of uh, people who are coaches and EFT or they've uh, the journey and they mightn't have thought of doing that, of, of giving some kudos to someone and that it's, you know, that, that in time it would be wonderful if that person would share it, but if they don't, at least to let that person know that they've mentioned them in the book. So, exactly, so yeah. That, and it, it's, it's smart to be thinking about this though, strategically too. So it's this paradox where I'm like, don't treat it just as a strategy, but know it's a strategy and then be yeah. conscious about going, be genuine okay, about it. Just as long as it's it's more the intention than the than just what you're doing. But that's the other thing is like there's a lot of people who you might really appreciate someone and you didn't think to mention them in your book. That's what I'm saying. It's great. Exactly. Like you're bringing up like, hey, as a reminder, who has been an influence? Okay, so can you mention them in your book? And it gets you. It's always this reorienting back to how can I help Zig Ziglar help enough people get what they want? you'll get what you want, you know? So it's like, okay, so how can I help these other people? How can I promote them? How can I share their work? And I'll mention this uh, briefly. When I started out, I didn't have like a big audience, right? I, like people didn't know me. So for me mentioning someone in my book, 
it, it probably wouldn't have meant much other than like um, just a kind gesture, but they still appreciated that, right? They're still like, oh, you know, yeah, I don't know if this book's going to sell anything or not, but that was really nice that this person mentioned uh, me in their book and they were appreciative and some people shared or tweeted about my book or whatever. Well, turns out it did go on to move tens of thousands of copies. So, you know, it did benefit them, but they were still, um, it's, it's like the thought that counts, right? Mm. If people see that you really care and that you're trying to help them out, uh, even before you have maybe the impact that you could have, it's, it's planting the seeds early. And then when you take off, uh, when your business takes off, when your book takes off and it, it grows and it, it does have this big impact, a lot of times people will be appreciative of the fact that like, hey, you were helping me out when you just got started. You might think about the people that were helping uh, mm. then turn this around and go, who can you help out who's maybe not at your level yet? Who yes, can you support yes. even when they're not there yet? And it always comes back to that uh, one yeah. hand up, one hand down. I mentality. like that. I think we could end on that. And this, um, and and before we do go, let's hear about where people can find you, Derek, because I know that although we're talking to authors, there is that the beyond being an author, there's a possibility of going on podcasts to market your book, which is something you teach, uh, the audio side of things. Tell us where you, you know, where people can find you and connect with you. Yeah, the best place to find me, you can you can connect with my email list and get a free copy of the book, Why Authors Fail. And that shows you 17 biggest mistakes authors make and how to fix them, which is the, the key part. And uh, first part of that really does cover some of the things when you're first writing a book. Uh, that's the best time to learn this. So that's at bestsellersecrets.com. So I'll put that in the show notes as well. Thanks for joining me on today's podcast. Want a free gift to inspire you further on your book writing adventure? My free checklist, five book hook tips to kickstart your book writing journey will help you get clarity on the key essentials to make your book a winner. Download it at writethebookinsideyou.com forward slash free gift. The links are in the show notes. Until next time, a big virtual hug and keep writing.